time was we finished glycolysis. And the three main products we got out of glycolysis were two ATPs, two net ATPs, two NADHs produced, and most importantly for today's lecture, two pyruvate molecules, which is where all the carbons from glucose went. So to remind yourself, glucose started with six carbons. Each pyruvate has three carbons. And today we're going to take those pyruvate molecules and see what happens to them as we progress down the pathway. We're going to turn pyruvate into acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA is going to enter the citric acid cycle. Ultimately, those carbons are converted to CO2, but not necessarily that round. We'll give you a great analogy for that. And then we'll turn all that energy in those molecules from oxidation into electrons we can harvest for the electron transport chain, which we'll talk about next time. Okay, so to start today, remember from glycolysis, we ended with a pair of pyruvate molecules. Okay, those pyruvate molecules are going to enter ultimately the citric acid cycle after we convert it to acetyl-CoA. So the name citric acid cycle, there's alternative names for this pathway. It's also known as the Krebs cycle, named after Krebs who described it. It's also known as the tricarboxylic acid cycle or TCA cycle. All those things, except for the name Krebs, refer to the same molecule, right? The citric acid molecule. So citric acid or it's in its deprotonated or conjugate base form called citrate. Citrate is a tricarboxylic acid, right? The conjugate base of it. It's got three carboxyl groups. So citric acid cycle and tricarboxylic acid are referring to the same thing. And then of course the Krebs cycle named after the discoverer and person who described it is also referring to the exact same thing. So it's three names for this same pathway. So to enter that, I need to convert my pyruvate into acetyl-CoA. What's shown on the right here is a picture of acetyl-CoA. There's clearly more than three carbons there. So what do I mean convert pyruvate into acetyl-CoA? Well, I don't really mean turn pyruvate into that entire thing. Pyruvate's gonna contribute two carbons to that big molecule. So you can really think of that big molecule on the right, everything drawn in black here is the coenzyme A, right? It's the carrier or the taxi or the shuttle that's gonna carry my carbons around for me. So I'm starting out with pyruvate with three carbons, two of which, shown here in the, the pink or red color, are going to get attached to this carrier or this taxi called CoA, all right, or coenzyme A. For short, we'll just call it CoA. A lot of people like to abbreviate it CoA and still show the S on the business end of it. So they'll write CoA-S or CoA-SH if there's nothing else on the S. You might see the sulfur at the very bottom. That's where the two carbons will be attached. Okay. You don't have to memorize this whole molecule, just know that a carrier exists. And you probably recognize parts of it. Right? The, the very top right of it, you see that double ring structure with all the nitrogens in it? You probably recognize that as an adenine ring, right? one of our bases from our nucleotides. Attached to it, you probably recognize the ribose sugar, right? which has three phosphates on it. And then attached to that is the panthothenic acid, which you don't need to know the structure of, we haven't talked about before. But the business end of the molecule is that sulfur. So you can rewrite all the stuff in black as simply as CoA, and then the two carbons are attached to it. Those two carbons are known as an acetyl group or acetyl group, and that two carbon group is attached to the sulfur. That is a thioester bond. That's not very stable. And so it's only on there temporarily. Right? We're going to take it right back off a little later. Okay, so how did we get here? So we're going to start with pyruvate. Okay, so looking at the diagram on the right, we start with glucose and we turn it into pyruvate. We did that last time, indicated by glycolysis there. What we're going to do today is convert pyruvate into the acetyl group that's going to go on acetyl-CoA. Then that's going to enter the citric acid cycle at the bottom, ultimately get turned into carbon dioxide through oxidation. That's the release of those electrons at the bottom. And we get a GTP out of it, or in some cases, in some organisms, that's an ATP. But it's an ATP or GTP equivalent. Okay. We'll get to that part later. Let's talk about the part that's boxed here first. Pyruvate being converted to acetyl-CoA. Again, remind yourself pyruvate has three carbons. The acetyl group that we just put on CoA only has two carbons, so we must have lost a carbon somewhere. We're going to decarboxylate pyruvate. So there's the CO2 you see leaving. We're also going to oxidize it once. 
That's the two electrons that are leaving. Remember, oxidation is removal of electrons. Well, those electrons have to go somewhere. When you do a redox reaction, something's oxidized, but something else is always reduced. So something is going to grab those electrons, and that's going to be NAD becoming NADH once again, okay, just like we did back in glycolysis. It's a little more complicated than that. I'm leaving out a lot of the details for this class, but I want you to get the general scheme that we're turning pyruvate, losing one of its carbons. There are two left. We're going to do one round of oxidation to make it an acetyl group and put it on CoA. Okay? The enzyme that does that, what's boxed over there, it's a huge complex. It's called the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. It's composed of three separate functional parts, enzymes, five cofactors, and it is enormous. It's millions and millions of atoms put together. Okay? And of course, something that large is probably not going to be floating around in the cell, and it makes sense that it's not. It's anchored to a membrane. It's actually in the membrane. It's one of those intrinsic membrane complexes. Remember when we talked about proteins, they could be soluble, they can be fibrous, and they can be in a membrane. This is one of those in a membrane type proteins, right? Several proteins, in fact. So what we're going to do is start with pyruvate at the top, turn it into our acetyl group on acetyl-CoA. But I said this is located in a membrane, and it matters which membrane. Okay? Glycolysis took place in the cytoplasm. Right, the big bulk solvent in the cell. So in the cytoplasm, where glycolysis turned glucose into a pair of pyruvates. Where the citric acid cycle takes place is in the matrix of the mitochondria. Well, let's do a little anatomy lesson on uh, mitochondria here. There's a micrograph of it there on the top left, or sorry, top right. And at the bottom right, we have a, a simple diagram showing the same thing. So the, the organelle has two membranes. There's a outer mitochondrial membrane drawn in blue in the diagram and that's the very outer layer shown in the picture there's an inner membrane which is kind of hard to distinguish in the picture but in the diagram you can see it's a separate layer right shown there in red or pink the inner mitochondrial membrane and because it has two membranes it generates three compartments or three spaces right if it only had a single membrane think of a bag if it only had a single barrier there would be an inside and an outside Right? Since there is two layers, we create three spaces. There's the very outside, which is the cytoplasm. There's the very inside, colored yellow here, called the matrix. And then there's the, the space between the two membranes. Right? It's called the intermembrane space. That name makes sense. It's between the outer and the inner membranes. So we have an outer membrane and an inner membrane that separates three compartments. The very outside, the cytoplasm the very inside, called the matrix, and the very small space between the membranes, not a lot of volume there, and that's called the intermembrane space. Initially, our pyruvate is out in the bulk, in the cytoplasm, and we need to get it into the matrix. So we have to cross two membranes. Crossing the outer membrane is not very difficult because it has holes in it. Right? That makes crossing it trivial. They can just go through the holes, as long as you're smaller than the hole, which pyruvate's a very tiny molecule, of course it can go through. Larger things like other mitochondria clearly can't go through those holes. In the inner membrane, however, it's a watertight barrier. Nothing gets through unless it, it lets it through. So the only things that can go through this barrier must go through channels or portals or have some way to get across. So our pyruvate can't just cross that membrane. Okay, there's no hole in it. So what we're going to do is put our pyruvate dehydrogenase complex in that membrane. And in the process of grabbing a pyruvate from the outside, and releasing it as the acetate on acetyl-CoA on the inside, we've crossed the membrane. So it's perfect location. We put it in the membrane to do that conversion. And as we do the conversion, it ends up on the other side of the membrane. So I'll, I'll restate that on the next slide when I show you how the reactions take place. So at the very top here, from left to right, we're going from pyruvate to acetyl-CoA. You can also imagine where I'm drawing these three reactions taking place where the, the big red box is, red, the big red bracket is, that's where the membrane is. That's the inner mitochondrial membrane where pyruvate would be on the outside and acetyl-CoA would be in the matrix on the inside. So we're crossing that membrane as we will cross this page. And you can also imagine that happening here. But this diagram isn't showing the exact chemistry that happens. It's a summary, right? which is what I want you to know. We don't have to go into all the details for this class. I want you to remember three things happen to the pyruvate. Number one, we're going to decarboxylate it. And if you look at the structure, the three carbons, one of them is a carboxyl group. 
the little dashed lines between the two O's and the carbon indicates that one of those two is a double bond and the other is not, right? So which one is, it changes back and forth all the time, could be either one, but it indicates one of them is a double bond and the other is an O minus. So it's your typical carboxyl group, right? That leaves as CO2. So they reform another double bond there. The carbon gets two bonds to each oxygen. It leaves a CO2 and that leaves some electrons behind, right? We indicate that not realistically here, but in this scheme, as a carbon left behind was a lone pair, which is not really how it happens. It's going to be attached to something, but we can think of it as the carbon has an extra pair of electrons there. In the next step, we remove two electrons. Well, if it has an extra pair, it's got a negative charge, and I take that pair away, I'm taking two negative charges away, so it won't end up neutral, it ended up with a lack of an electron, which means it has a positive charge. It really doesn't look like this, but it's still attached to something else, but we can visualize it here as the carbon is losing a pair of electrons, that's our oxidation step, they're going to be given ultimately to NAD to become NADH, and then we have a, a carbocation left behind, which just means a carbon with a positive charge. Re remember, it really doesn't look like this, but schematically, this is what's happening. So we decarboxylated it, we oxidized it, and then because it has this charge, it'd love to make another bond. So CoA, remember the big molecule from the first slide, its sulfur comes in and says, I'll happily make a bond to this carbon. You can have a fourth bond with me. All right, so we transfer it onto the CoA molecule, that's our third and final step, and we've made acetyl-CoA. The CoA is waiting in the matrix to do this. The pyruvate shows up on the outside. So we also transferred our two carbons across the membrane, the inner mitochondrial membrane, at the same time. All right, so this reaction is completely irreversible. It cannot go backwards, right? The, the, the main reason it can't go backwards is the very first step. Right, that loss of CO2, decarboxylation, is generally irreversible. Right? There are very few instances where it's not. If you lose CO2, you can think of it's not coming back. It's a gas, it's leaving, it's gone, never coming back, it's gone away. So when a molecule decarboxylates, you can think this is going to be an irreversible reaction. Okay? So it loses the CO2, we oxidize it to remove a couple of electrons, that's going to make another NAD into NADH. And then we transfer the remaining two carbons, that's our acetyl group, onto CoA to make acetyl-CoA. That's the bulk of pyruvate dehydrogenase. Why is it named pyruvate dehydrogenase? Because the main step in here when we categorize this enzyme is a redox reaction, the second step. Remember you learned your six classes of enzymes, and it, if it had a redox reaction in it, that's the class we called it, even if it did other things. This one clearly does other things, but it is a redox reaction, so we're going to name it a dehydrogenase. Okay, so we've made acetyl-CoA. Keep in mind you know those three steps that's going on and where things are happening. We're starting in the cytoplasm to make pyruvate. It can easily cross that outer membrane because it's got holes in it. And then when it gets to the inner mitochondrial membrane, we do this reaction within the membrane, resulting in acetyl-CoA in the matrix on the right. All right. Any questions on this so far? This is the, the beginnings or getting to the citric acid cycle. All we've done is prepare our molecule for the citric acid cycle. We haven't started the cycle yet. We're about to. Okay, so let's see how this molecule is regulated. When would you want to do this? When would you want to not do this as much? And so if you look at the bottom right, we can just look at this figure and it should make sense logically. Just think about it. If you have a lot of ATP in the cell, and of course the processes we've been talking about, glycolysis and this pyruvate dehydrogenase complex and then citric acid cycle and electron transport chain and ATP synthesis, which we'll get to, their goal is to make ATP. Right? So the goal of all this is to construct new ATP molecules from ADP and phosphate. If you are abundant in ATP, you probably want to do, don't want to do this as much. But if you are very low in ATP, that's B over here, the low energy charge, or actively working cells like during exercise or muscle contractions, you probably need ATP. So you want to do this reaction. So if you had to guess what controls 
whether this enzyme works or it doesn't work as much, you think it would detect the amount of ATP in the cell. And that's exactly what it does. So if ATP is in abundance, that's shown in panel A, right? it turns off pyruvate dehydrogenase. But if ATP is not in abundance, our first problem is how do you detect something that's not there? It's easy to detect something if it is there, it binds to it. How do you detect something that's absent? Well, you detect its alternative. If ATP is not present, right, not a lot of it, then there must be an abundance of its breakdown products, ADP. So it binds ADP instead of ATP, which turns this enzyme on or makes it more active. If ATP is more abundant, it will compete with ADP to bind here and, of course, turn the enzyme down, make it work not as well. So it regulates the expression of ATP by turning this enzyme up or down. How does it actually do that? Well, this enzyme isn't, doesn't bind ATP directly like the figure indicates. It's more like the figure at the top. Right, where the, the yellow square is still our enzyme, our yellow circle on the left and square on the right, is still our enzyme, but the enzyme is either phosphorylated, that's the square with the little P on it, or not phosphorylated, the circle without the phosphate. And of course, a kinase puts phosphates on things, that's what they do, at the expense of an ATP. Now that's not the same ATP as the one below, this, now it's a donor of the phosphate, not just an indication of how much energy we have. And of course, a phosphatase could remove it. Phosphatases are always active in the cell. They're always constantly cutting phosphates off. But if the kinase is active, it'll keep putting it back on. And so as long as we want to keep this thing turned off, we keep putting that phosphate back on. Right? We'll only do that if ATP is abundant. And if ATP is abundant, the kinase will put the phosphate on, and it'll turn this enzyme off because we don't need as much right now. If ATP becomes lacking, then the kinase doesn't have as much ATP as a substrate. The ADP indicates we should leave this enzyme on, so the phosphatase wins the battle, and for the most part, the phosphates are all removed, leaving an active enzyme. Okay? On the left, you see our connection. Just like the picture I showed before, we can turn glucose into pyruvate. We did that last time, that was glycolysis. We didn't talk about the other pathway, but I can turn pyruvate back into glucose. That's called gluconeogenesis. Right? It's not literally the reactions run backwards. There's some irreversible ones. You remember steps 1, 3, and 10. We have to find alternate routes around, but we're not going to talk about it in this class. Just know that it's possible to turn pyruvate back into glucose. That's called gluconeogenesis. So those two pathways completely can be interchanged. I can turn glucose into pyruvate. I can turn pyruvate back into glucose to store it. Right? I haven't limited myself. However, if I turn pyruvate into acetyl-CoA by this enzyme, the little green arrow on the left, you know this is an irreversible step. You can't go backwards. Once I turn it into acetyl-CoA, I can never turn it back into pyruvate, at least not a net conversion to pyruvate. The acetyl-CoA can do one of two things mainly. It can go through the citric acid cycle, which we'll talk about next, and be converted to CO2. So I oxidize it completely to CO2, get some electrons out of it to do the electron transport chain. Or I can store it as lipids, which we'll do that lecture after electron transport chain and ATP synthase. Okay. So we can store acetyl-CoA as lipids, and of course we can break down lipids to make more acetyl-CoA. That's reversible. But I can never go back to pyruvate. So ultimately what this chart is telling you is if you start with sugars at the top, you can always turn sugars in your diet into fats or lipids at the bottom. But I can never turn lipids or fats back into sugars at the top because I can't go backwards through that green step. Right? There's only one place that that actually happens where we could turn fats back into sugars and that's in the seeds of plants. Right? They have a special bypass that lets them do that, but obviously we don't make seeds so we can't do that. So as humans we can turn sugars into fats but we can never turn fats into sugars. Okay, on to the citric acid cycle. And I want you to start with just looking at the diagram on the top right. And all we're gonna do is count carbons to start with. We'll deal with the structures in a minute, but before we start getting into details of the, the molecules look and how they react, let's just count carbons first. That C2 you see at the top is our acetyl of the acetyl-CoA. Right, it's the one we just made. Right? 
We're going to combine the acetyl group of the acetyl-CoA, we're only interested in those two carbons at the end, to another four carbon molecule called oxaloacetate. Okay, we're not going to talk about how that one is made. It's also made from pyruvate very simply. We just put an extra carbon on it. It goes from three to four. So I have a C4, four carbon molecule, combining it with a two carbon molecule, which will make a six carbon molecule. That's four plus two is six. That six carbon molecule you see there is represented by the name of the cycle. That's citrate. Right. We do a couple reactions as we go around the cycle. We'll see it's eight total reactions. We just described the first one. So two plus four making six, we're making citrate. We're gonna convert citrate into another six carbon molecule not shown in this figure called isocitrate, but it really didn't do much to it. We just moved a group around. And then we're gonna convert that isocitrate into a five carbon molecule that is shown in the figure. How do you go from six carbons to five carbons? You're gonna to have to lose a carbon and we're gonna lose it as CO2, as you see. We're also gonna do something else in converting that six carbon molecule to the five carbon alpha ketoglutarate, and that's we're gonna do another oxidation. And that's how we get our NADH out of this. And NAD plus is gonna be converted to an NADH. Okay? In the next step, we convert a five carbon molecule to a four carbon molecule. This is almost identical to the last step. We're gonna lose a carbon of CO2 again. We're gonna do another oxidation. From this point on, I don't lose any more carbons because I have four the rest of the way back to regenerating my oxaloacetate. But along the way, I'm gonna get some energy out of this. There's some, still some energy in the bonds of this thing. It's still attached to a CoA at this point on C4. So we're gonna be able to break that thioester bond and get an ATP or a GTP out of it. And then of course, we need to do a couple more oxidations and we'll finish it up with three very rapid reactions where I have an acronym to help you remember them. It's an oxidation, a hydration, and then another oxidation, and we're back to oxaloacetate. Okay, so overall, what are we doing? Tell yourself a story. We're gonna take a two carbons, we just crossed the membrane, right? We got the acetyl group across the membrane, combine it with a four carbon molecule that's already in the matrix to make citrate. We're gonna briefly turn it into isocitrate, that's not so difficult. We're gonna decarboxylate it down to five as we oxidize. We're gonna decarboxylate it down to four as we oxidize again. And then we're gonna get some energy out of breaking a bond, still has four carbons. Then we'll do an oxidation, hydration, oxidation, still at four carbons, but we're back to oxaloacetate at the top of the cycle again. And we repeat it with yet another acetyl-CoA that enters. So all the carbons from the acetyl-CoA, the, the acetyl group, ultimately get turned into CO2, just not the same two this round. We'll get to that later. But we keep repeating the cycle over and over. What do we get out of this cycle? We get a lot of NADHs and FADH2, some CO2s, which we just let go, right? We don't care about those. And then we have this GTP or ATP, if it's bacteria, as an energetic molecule as a product. Okay? So we get a lot more out of this than we did glycolysis, right? Although we only get one GTP, we get plenty of NADH and FADH2 compared to the two we got out of glycolysis for one glucose. Keep in mind, I'm describing this for only one acetyl-CoA. In fact, to be fair, we should describe it for two compared to one glucose. So we get a lot more electrons out of this. That's what the E minus at the bottom is there. That's where represented by all these NADHs and FADH2s. Okay, ultimately, we're gonna take all those electrons, send them down the electron transport chain. They're gonna pump some protons across the membrane. We're gonna let them come back across the membrane and that's gonna make ATP, but that's for next time. And let's get into our steps of the citric acid cycle here. And there's eight steps I want you to know. And we had 10 in glycolysis, there's only gonna be eight here, okay? So here's the picture in the bottom right is again about 75% of what you need to know for the citric acid cycle. If you can reproduce that, you're 75% of the way there. I don't want you to memorize all these numbers, um, the, the delta G naughts and the kilocalories per mole or kilojoules per mole. I want you to remember what we did for glycolysis. If a reaction has a large delta G, that indicates what? Now, I didn't say large and negative, I just said large. It could be positive or it could be negative. If it's a very large number, positive or negative, what does that indicate? It's an irreversible reaction. Exactly. Now, do I know which way it's going to go by the, the magnitude of that number? Not really. Which way it's gonna go is determined by the sign of that number. 
right? I don't mean sine as in sine or cosine, I mean the plus or minus. So if it's a large number, and it's a large negative number, you're right in that it's going to be irreversible due to the number being large, and it's only going to go in the direction described because it was a negative delta g, so the forward direction. If it's a large positive number, it will tend to only go in the other direction. Okay? If it's a very small number, whether positive or negative, it means it's reversible, which is the opposite of what you said is being irreversible for the large ones. So that makes sense. It doesn't matter if it's large or small, or so it doesn't matter if it's positive or negative, as long as it's a small number. Now, all this talk of large and small numbers, where do you draw the line? What's large, what's small? Well, we tend to draw if it has more energy than an ATP, which is around negative 7, negative 7.5, right, kilocals per mole, then we're going to consider it large. If it has less than that, you know, twos, fives, less than one, something like that, those are small and considered completely reversible, okay? So what we're going to look up here on the numbers at the top is we're going to consider three steps here that we're going to call metabolically irreversible, okay? Now, Looking at them, you can guess that number one, step one, and number four, step four there, you agree they're large and negative by that scale, right? They're not tiny like 0 0.8 and 0 0.5 and 2. They're seven or greater, right? Those are definitely going to be irreversible, right? And they're negative, so they're only going to go in the direction indicated. But why the minus two? Why am I calling that one irreversible, right? It's only a minus two. It should be fully reversible. We'll see why in a second. Right? And then, of course, you're probably staring at number eight saying, hey, that thing's positive seven. It shouldn't happen at all. It only goes the other way. And for the most part, you're right. If left to its own devices, it would rather go the other direction. And we're going to force it to go forward by adding more substrate and removing its product. That's Le Chatelier's principle. If I keep adding product to a reaction and or removing product from a reaction, sorry, adding substrate and removing product, then it tends to go in the direction indicated, forward direction. If I add a lot of product and I remove the substrates, it tends to go in the other direction. So we can force number eight to go forward by forcing it, adding more substrate, removing product. Okay, so of these steps, the ones I want you to remember that are irreversible are mainly steps three and four. Right. One is technically also reversible because we can force it to go backwards just like number eight. But I really want you to remember steps three and four as irreversible. And if you look back at the diagram on the previous slide and the, or the one down below on the right, can you tell me why I'm confident steps three and four are irreversible? Right. Step one is citrate synthase. That's the, the top of the figure where you're making citrate. So steps three and four are the ones on the right that say isocitrate dehydrogenase and alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. Why do you think those are going to be irreversible? Because you're losing a carbon. Yeah, I'm losing that CO2. You're absolutely right. So just because the number isn't so, you know, negative 30 or something, you're losing a CO2, which makes it difficult for this to go backwards because it could, but it'd have to capture a CO2, right? And that's difficult to do when it leaves. And so you're absolutely right. I want you to remember steps three and four are irreversible. Step one is sort of irreversible. It tends not to go backwards in the cell, right? But you could force it to go backwards, say, in a test tube if you added all the ingredients. So that's why we're calling them metabolically. So inside a cell, these tend to not go backwards. That's what I mean by that. Okay. So let's look at that figure on the bottom right a little closer. Right? And let's go through these steps. There are eight steps, and I want you to make some notes about each step. We're going to call the first step where we introduce the new carbons at citrate synthase step one. And so at that point, you see in green, we have two new carbons showing up. I apologize, the color changed from the other slide where they were pink, but here they're green. Right, so the two new carbons show up on a CoA. They combine with oxaloacetate. You see the CoA leaves, and we make citrate. And so what's really happening? I want you to try to remember which carbon is which, and they, they track them for you for a little while. So the four carbons of oxaloacetate are sitting there. The two new carbons come in. How did I attach them? Well, if you look at the green carbons and you see the carbon on the left is a methyl group, a CH3. If I were to lose one of its hydrogens, right, one of its protons, and become CH2, then that CH2 would attack the carbonyl on oxaloacetate. What I mean by that is 
the carbon that is a methyl group loses one of its hydrogens and then makes a bond to the double bonded carbon to the oxygen of oxaloacetate, right? the one in the middle there. And if you look on the, the citrate molecule, you see the, the green ones have kind of been inserted or attached in the middle of the other four carbons. Right? They've, they've turned the figure upside down on you for oxaloacetate. Imagine flipping it upside down. That's how you see it in citrate up there. And when the, the carbon that was a methyl group, as now CH2, attacks this carbonyl, right? that carbon can't have five bonds. So the carbonyl, the double bonded oxygen, becomes a single bonded oxygen and it gets an H put on it. The H comes from the water molecule. Right? So this OH is now over here on the right. So you can track our two new carbons. They're the green ones. We've made citrate. And if I asked you a question about citrate, you see the three carboxyl groups on it. That's why it's called a tricarboxylic acid. It also has a hydroxy group right there in the middle on that third carbon. Right? So what type of alcohol would citrate be if you had to classify it? Is it primary, secondary, tertiary, none of the above? What do you think? Tertiary? It's tertiary. How'd you get that? Um, because the carbon that's attached to the alcohol is bonded to three other carbons. That's exactly right. So. And what else do you remember about tertiary carbons or tertiary alcohols? What can you not do to them? I have no idea. We did this during the alcohols. We could do this to primary and secondary alcohols, but not tertiaries. You also did this in lab. Oxidize, correct. So to primary and secondary alcohols, we could oxidize respectively to aldehydes and ketones, but tertiaries you could not oxidize. And the reason is there was no H on that carbon to remove because it was bonded to three other carbons. So citrate is kind of stuck. We'd like to oxidize it, but we can't. So what I need to do is make it either a primary or secondary alcohol instead. So in step two here, that's what we're going to do. I'm telling you the story this way to give you a rationale for the next step. Why would you want to do this? So citrate is being turned into isocitrate. And all we're doing is moving the OH from the carbon it's on up to carbon number two. It's on number three. We're going to move it up to number two. And of course, number two's H moves to number three. So if you look at isocitrate, the only difference is the OH is now one carbon up. Okay. Now what kind of alcohol is it? Secondary. Secondary, exactly. So the, the OH is on a carbon attached to two other carbons, right? There's an H on that carbon now. So I could oxidize this thing, and it's exactly what we're going to do in the next step. So if you follow in a story, we assembled citrate, but it was tertiary. So we need to make it a secondary alcohol. So we moved it up to number two. The rationale for that is so we could oxidize it. So in our next step, we're going to oxidize that OH group. And when we do so, a secondary alcohol becomes a what? Ketone. Ketone. So if you're following along in the picture, the second carbon down is still the second carbon down in the picture. It is now a ketone. Right? When we make that ketone, however, we've set up a situation where that ketone, that carbonyl, is beta to another carbonyl. Right? So this one right here. On the left of isocitrate, the, the carboxyl group, the COO minus in black on carbon three, if I make carbon two's OH into a carbonyl, that arrangement is not stable at all. Right? So you can't have them beta to each other. In other words, you can't have two single bonds between the two carbonyls. It's very unstable. So what we do is we oxidize it to a carbonyl, which gives the molecule incentive to lose that carbon on the far left as CO2. And you notice it's gone. So this CO2 on the far left is now gone, and it's just CH2 left there. And so we've gone down from six carbons to five carbons. To do that, we had to make it a secondary alcohol and then oxidize it. 
When we oxidized it, we had to take some electrons away and some protons that go with them. And that's what the NAD to NADH is accomplishing. This is a simple redox reaction. And along the way to, to resolve it, we got rid of a, a CO2. Now I have five carbons. You notice the two carbons I added in the beginning are still there. Right, we have not lost them. So the, vein, the, same, the two green carbons I put on at the beginning are still there at this stage. All right, in the very next step, we're going to play a similar game where we're going to lose the CO2. Right? So if the carbon number one up there, if it were to lose its connection to number two and become CO2, that would leave behind what kind of group? If you just lose that CO2, carbon number two would simply be a carbonyl with an H on it. What kind of group would that be? An, al an aldehyde, yes. So an aldehyde is a reactive molecule, you learned, and I can do what to aldehydes rather easily? You can oxidize. I could. I could reduce them as well, but we're in the business of oxidizing here. So we're going to oxidize it again, and an aldehyde, when oxidized, would become a carboxylic acid. And I'm going to take that carboxylic acid and combine it with a CoA. Remember, CoA's business end is just an SH. So this is a lot like forming an ester. If you take a carboxylic acid and an alcohol, you lose water and you make an ester. Instead of using an alcohol, we did this in class as well, I'm going to use a thiol. Instead of OH, it's SH. I'm still going to lose water as the product, and the sulfur, since it was on the alcohol, or the thiol in this case, ends up in the product, in the ester. So I make an ester, but we're going to call it a thioester, and that's shown down below with succinyl coa Right, so we have this carbonyl with an SR group, right? So that is a thioester. Thioesters are not nearly as stable as regular esters, so there's some energy in that bond. We'll take advantage of in just a minute. Okay, but to do that, we had to turn our aldehyde into a carboxyl group. We lost the CO2, right? The carbon at the top. Again, it's not one of the green ones, it's one of the black ones we lost. Right? We lost the CO2, we take the resulting aldehyde, oxidize it to a carboxylic acid condense it with a CoA to make this thioester. Okay, so now I have succinyl-CoA. Again, this reaction converts one NAD to NADH, and I lost the CO2. Don't be concerned that I had to consume a CoA at this point. We're going to get it right back in the next step. Okay, so in the next step, that thioester bond I was talking about is not very stable, so we'll break it. But we're not going to let water do it. We're going to let a phosphate do it. So a phosphate comes in, instead of water, and it breaks that bond. Right? It releases the CoA molecule. But now I have a phosphate stuck on my succinyl. And so from that point, that's not stable. Again, it's beta-keto arrangement. So a GDP, or in bacteria, it's ADP, but we'll say GDP for humans, comes in and takes that phosphate away to make GD GTP. So that bond is so unstable, it's enough energy to put it on another GDP. And so I get a high energy phosphate bond out of it. You can think of it as getting one ATP equivalent out of this step. Okay? And now something interesting has happened. Or hopefully you've noticed. I lose the CoA and I'm left with just succinate. Right? It's just a four carbon molecule. We've got a carboxyl group on each end. Right? And two CH2s in the middle. If you had to name this with your IUPAC names, can you hear the test question already? What would you name this? It's a four carbon dicarboxylic acid. Right, so four carbons, what would you call that? Would you call that a butane dioic acid? That's exactly what you call it. So four carbons, butane. It's a carboxylic acid, so butanoic acid. However, there were two of them, so butane dioic acid. I don't have to tell you where they are because you know carboxyl groups are always on the ends. So we just simply call it succinate. But you notice something else about succinate. It's a symmetrical molecule. The two carbons at the top, identical to the two carbons at the bottom. 
So we were tracking those two new green carbons all the way through, and we knew where they were until this point. When the enzyme lets the succinate go, it can tumble, right? It can float around in the, in the matrix of the mitochondria at this point. But which two carbons are the two new carbons? This is another potential test question. So if I label them top to bottom, A, B, C, D, right? So carbon at the top, A, the first CO2, B, the second CO2, C, and the last carboxyl group, D, which pairs of carbons are the two new carbons? Would a potential answer be A and D? Or tell me why that's wrong. Go ahead. So I'm, I'm labeling the succinate top to bottom, A, B, C, D, for the carbons. Which ones are the two new green ones? Would it be C and D? C and D is one possible answer. There's another. Or A and B. A and B would also be a correct answer because I don't know which one it is. But any other combination would be wrong, like A and D, or B and C, or A and C, or something like that. So there's lots of wrong answers there. So it's either the two on one end or the two on the other end. But I don't know which pair yet, right? Because it could be either one. It's tumbling at this point, so I'm unsure. So up until this point, I could track them, but I can't track them anymore. And I have a, a great analogy for that I'll tell you after this. Okay, and the next step, we're down to four carbons. So I don't have to remove any more carbons of CO2. I just need to get, to get succinate here to look like oxaloacetate so I can do this again. What's the difference between succinate at the bottom of the screen and the oxaloacetate we started with? What is the only difference? One, two. Say that again. There's a ketone on carbon number two. Right, so there's a carbonyl on carbon number two. Right, We don't have that yet, so we need to get it there. Right, And to get it there, we're going to play a little round called OHIO. Right? It's three reactions. I refer to it with the acronym OHIO because they stand for oxidation, hydration, oxidation. If you spell OHIO with a Y, it looks even better. Right? So oxidation, hydration, oxidation. So in the first step, we're going to do an oxidation. We're going to turn succinate into fumarate, and all I'm doing is removing a pair of electrons and a pair of hydrogens, a pair of protons that go with them, right? And they go on to FAD to make FADH2, and I'm left with a double bond behind. So I'm turning an alkane into an alkene, right? You notice the other carbons in the end didn't get involved, and they won't the rest of the way. So if you look at fumarate, the result of that, it's also a symmetrical molecule. So which carbons of fumarate are my original green ones? The ones I added this round. Again, it could be the top two or the bottom two. I can't tell the difference. It's certainly not the two in the middle, right? It's either the top pair or the bottom pair. And the molecule is still totally symmetrical. It can flip around and tumble. In the next step, we're gonna do almost what Markovnikov said, right? Remember addition reactions? But in this case, this is a symmetrical bond so the OH could go on either carbon, two or three. It doesn't really matter which one you put it on, you're going to get the same result either way. So it's almost a Markovnikov addition, except we're adding an asymmetrical molecule, water, to a symmetrical double bond, so we get the same product either way, and that's malate. So this double bond goes back to being a single bond, and one of the hydrogens, or sorry, one of the carbons gets H, and one of the carbons gets the OH. Which one doesn't really matter because it's the same answer. In fact, the enzyme always puts it on the same side, but it doesn't matter because you get the same result either way. And that's malate. Now, looking at malate, we're no longer symmetrical, right? The top two and the bottom two aren't identical anymore. So which ones are the original green ones? Well, the answer is still either the top two or the bottom two carbons. But which one it becomes at this point is not interchangeable anymore. It's not symmetrical. So whichever it is, it's fixed at this point. But I don't know which one it is. And in the very last step, we did oxidation, hydration, and now oxidation again. 
we're going to turn the secondary alcohol into the ketone you described, right, using NAD to NADH. That's malate dehydrogenase. And we're back where we started with oxaloacetate. Okay, so going around the cycle again, right, we'll add two more carbons, we'll make citrate, turn it into isocitrate, lose a pair of carbons, and go around over and over and over, as long as it keeps supplying new acetyl-CoAs. Okay. So I want to show you those steps in detail. I'm not going to read all the slides to you, but what's going on in each step is exactly what we showed in this picture, but every little detail shown here. Right? Oxaloacetate on the left in blue, acetyl-CoA in pink here, sorry for the color changes, but you see which one's attacking what. The methyl group on acetyl-CoA becomes a CH2. We remove a hydrogen, right, a proton. And that carbon attacks the blue carbonyl on the left, and that O becomes an OH. And now I have citriol-CoA. Water comes along and cuts off the CoA, and I have citrate. Right, very simple. Right, so citrate here, again, you told me it was a tertiary alcohol, which is correct. So I need to convert it to, at the top, secondary alcohol. So all we're going to do is remove a water molecule and then add a water molecule right back, but this time make sure the OH goes on the second carbon, not the third. So there's essentially two lyases mechanistically. We're going to remove water to make an alkene, that's dehydration. Then we're going to hydrate it right back to make the alcohol again. Overall, we didn't add or remove any net atoms, so it is an isomerase. But mechanistically, it's like a pair of lyases. Okay, so we took water away, and then we added water right back, making sure to put it on the other carbon. That's all this enzyme does. Unlike chemical reactions that you do in a, a test tube in a lab, enzymatic reactions generally do exactly one product, not a major and minor products. Okay, so we now moved it up to number two. We have a secondary alcohol. And why did we do that? So we could oxidize it. So on to step three, let's oxidize it. So we oxidize that OH to a carbonyl, shown in pink down there. And as soon as we do that, it's favorable for that blue carboxyl group to leave because we said it was an unstable beta keto acid. So the CO2 leaves, leaving behind alpha ketoglutarate. Alpha ketos, very stable. Beta ketos, not stable. Clearly our product is stable because it's alpha ketos in the name, right? It's an alpha keto arrangement. Okay, this reaction is considered irreversible because of that loss of CO2. Okay. We take our alpha ketoglutarate, do another oxidation to it, we lose the CO2, we oxidize the resulting aldehyde, right? and then we put it on CoA. This should sound familiar. Lose the CO2, that's decarboxylation, oxidize it, remove some electrons, and then put it on CoA. Does this sound familiar? Those three steps in a row. Decarboxylate, oxidize, transfer to CoA. This is exactly the same three steps we did when we were talking about our pyruvate dehydrogenase. Remember when we turned pyruvate into acetyl-CoA, the prep step for the citric acid cycle. It's the exact same chemistry. The only difference here, instead of using pyruvate, it uses alpha-ketoglutarate, two carbons longer. Put your hand over the bottom two carbons of alpha-ketoglutarate and it looks exactly like pyruvate. Right? It's just a little longer molecule. So the enzyme works exactly the same way. It's a different enzyme, but mechanistically, it has all the same parts. It just uses a different or a longer substrate. Right? So we end up with the same products. We get a CO2 released, we get an NADH released, and we get our four carbon molecule, instead of two carbon molecule, stuck on CoA. Okay? We're done losing carbons at this point, but we have a CoA molecule attached to a carbonyl here. It's a thioester bond. We can break it and get some energy out of it, so that's done in the next step. I told you a phosphate comes along and breaks that bond, not water. And then the phosphate is taken away by GDP to make a GTP. So we get our CoA back and we make a GTP out of this. At this point, we lose track of our two carbons that were added this round, and succinate could be top two or bottom two as the new carbons. And then we finish it off with three steps, the Ohio mechanism. So we oxidize it once to make the fumarate, putting the double bond in there. We hydrate that double bond, right, to put the OH back on. We turn the alkane 
into an alkene, and then an alkene into an alcohol. And then finally, we oxidize our secondary alcohol to a ketone. And we're right back where we started. Okay. So I'd like to tell you a, a, an analogy to help you remember this. Um, I can't take full credit for this analogy. It was published in 1973 by Bernard Brown in Manchester at the School of Medical Sciences. It's a very short blurb of a paper. It, that's the entire paper oh, there on the right. But I pulled out the part that he wrote about the analogy he came up with. Uh, half a century ago, he probably taught this in his class in a little more detail. I uh, wasn't around to, to attend that class, obviously. But he probably went into a little more detail than just this one sentence. But he wrote in the paper, finally, some idea of the nature of the Krebs cycle can be imparted by comparing it to a striptease on a Ferris wheel. And he said, few students will forget this analogy. He doesn't go into any detail about the analogy or try to explain it, which I'm sure he did in his classes, but never in his paper. So in the past decade, I've used my version of what I think he means by this to explain what's going on. Of course, we'll, we'll keep this uh, PG-13. So if you imagine a, a Ferris wheel and you get on the Ferris wheel and you're going around, at some point on the Ferris wheel, someone throws you a pair of socks. All right, so we're going to say the socks represent our two new carbons. So you are the oxaloacetate molecule at this point, and someone throws you a pair of socks when you put them on. So now you're wearing the two green carbons. You have your socks on. Okay? And the next step, maybe you stand on your head or something. Nothing really happens. You become an isomer. right? So nothing really happens to you. And the third step, right, where we lose a CO2, you definitely do not lose a sock. Right? The two new green carbons do not leave. So you probably lost a glove. Right? You had gloves on when you started, so you threw a glove off. Right? And you can see that the carbon leaving is not one of the new green ones. It was the carboxyl group that was in the middle of the molecule. Right? So you lost a glove. In the next step where we do the oxidation of alpha ketoglutarate, you lose an earring perhaps. Right? It's definitely not one of your socks you just put on. So we lost the other carboxyl group, right? One of the ones that was already there. So what's left is you plus your two socks. You still have them both. When you do the succinyl CoA synthase step, in other words, you cut the succinyl off of the CoA, right? We're left with succinate, but I don't know which parts of you are sock anymore, right? I can't tell, right? The two new carbons become confused with the other carbons. I know which two it could be. It could be the top pair or the bottom pair, but I don't know which ones. So let's say we finish the cycle, we get all the way back here to oxaloacetate, and you know either the top two or the bottom two are your socks, the new carbons that came on that round. So we made it all the way around the Ferris wheel. We're going to do one more time. This time I'm going to throw you, let's do something else. How about a belt and a hat? Okay, so you're wearing our two socks. You don't know where they are. They're either this pair of carbons at the top, or this pair of carbons at the bottom, and I threw you two more carbons, a belt and a hat. You put them on. Here's your belt and hat. Now looking at citrate, those two green ones at the top are the belt and hat. Where are the original socks that I gave you last round? Well, looking back at oxaloacetate, you said they're the top pair or the bottom pair. In citrate, that would represent, again, the top pair or the middle pair now. Right? So either the two at the top or the two in the middle they're not colored anymore, right? They're, they're not green anymore. Those are your socks from last round. The two green ones now are the belt and hat I just gave you. And you already know you're not going to lose a belt and hat this round, just like you didn't lose a sock last round. So let's follow them through. The two top carbons could be your socks, or the two middle ones could be the socks. Move over to isocitrate. They're still there. The top two or the middle two could be your socks. And the very next step, isocitrate dehydrogenase, I'm going to lose a CO2. Was it a sock? Is the question. Well, I lost this CO2, the middle one. If the top pair were socks, then no, I did not lose a sock. If the middle pair were the socks, then I did lose a sock. Okay, so I may have lost a sock at this point. I'm not sure. It's 50-50 chance. Let's move on to the next step. And this will make a lot more sense after this step. In this step, I lose this carbon, right? The top carboxyl group, right? It leaves a CO2. And I'm left with succinyl-CoA. The bottom two are my belt and hat, still green. The other two carbons, what are they? 
Well, let's track them again. The top two carbons of isocitrate could have been SOX, or the middle two could have been the SOX. I lose one CO2 from the middle group. So if it was a SOX, I have one SOX left. If it was not a SOX, I'm still wearing both. In the next step, I lose one from the top pair. So had the top pair been the SOX, I have now lost exactly one SOX, this one. Had the middle pair been the SOX, I've also lost exactly one SOX, but never both. I lost one from each of the pairings. So by the time I get to succinyl-CoA in the second round here, I got my new belt and hat on, and I've, I'm wearing exactly one of the two socks from last round. Not both of them, not zero, exactly one of the two. So what this says is every time I go through a round of the citric acid cycle, I gain two new carbons, I do not lose those two this round, guaranteed. But I will lose exactly one of those two carbons in the next round. That's what they, this analogy refers to. And how did we figure all this out? They did it by labeling the carbons with radioisotopes, with C13, C14, and so forth, right? And figuring out which CO2s were radioactive as we did this, okay? So as it goes around, every time you get a new acetyl-CoA, like the green one shown in the figure, you do not lose one of those carbons this round, but you will lose exactly one of the two the next round. And the two new ones for the next round, of course, are not lost that round. They will be lost one of the two, exactly one of the two, the subsequent round, the third round, and so forth. What happens to the one I don't lose gets jumbled up when I get to succinate. So if you look at succinate in the bottom, you know the bottom two or the top two could be my belt and hat from this round. And one of the other two is a sock. I don't know which one anymore. And if I went through a third round, I'd lose track of the belt and hat. I'd lose one of them that round and completely lost track of my sock. Okay, hopefully this little analogy, which he didn't explain, but I'm sure he did 50 years ago in his classes, something akin to that, helps you track the carbons. Right? The idea is you do not lose a carbon you entered that entered this round. You lose exactly one of those two in the next round. Okay. So here's the summary of that whole reaction. But keep in mind, when I write acetyl-CoA becoming two CO2s, it's not those carbons this round. Okay? We're just writing a net reaction here. An acetyl-CoA enters and two CO2s leave in one round. That's true. They're not the same carbons, however. Because what's not shown in this net reaction is we had to add an oxaloacetate, and in the end we get an oxaloacetate back, so it's not in the net reaction. So just keep in mind that that acetyl-CoA does not represent the same two carbons. And what else do we get out of this? We turn three NADs into NADHs, one FAD into FADH2, so that's a total of eight electrons, two for each of those molecules. We got one GTP made from a GDP in bacteria, that'll be ATP. And we got a couple protons that go with the NADHs and we consumed a couple water molecules. Right? But the goal here is We've converted carbons net to CO2 and converted NADs and FADs into their reduced counterparts, NADH and FADH2. In other words, I've captured some electrons. I'm going to hand those electrons down a chain next time. Okay. I did get one GTP out of it, or one ATP equivalent each round. Okay. So how do we regulate this thing? Do I want this going all the time? Do I want this off sometimes? Of course. Just like with the feeder reaction, if I have a lot of ATP, I don't want to do this very much. If I'm lacking ATP, I'd like to do this more. So it's the same regulation. Okay? Which steps in this eight-step pathway do you think would be the best place to regulate it? This is a general rule in all of biochemistry. Which steps would be the best place to regulate it? We ask the same question in glycolysis. Mm. Or let's, let's ask it a different way. What quality would a step have to make it a good point of regulation? It is irreversible. Irreversible would be a great idea, 
because once I do it, I can't go back. I'm committed. That's a great idea. So which steps here are considered irreversible? You've answered this one a couple times already. It's the same answer. The one that loses the CO2? Yes, steps three and four, isocitrate dehydrogenase and alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase, where you lose the CO2s. Right? Remember step one up there, we also considered metabolically irreversible, so we might want to regulate it there too, the citrate synthase. So steps one, where we enter the cycle, and steps three and four, which were irreversible, that's where we're regulated. Okay? So that's what I wrote on here. And I summarize that in this slide here. So pyruvate to acetyl-CoA at the very top was my feeder reaction. And we already said that was irreversible because of the loss of CO2, right? Isocitrate to alpha-ketoglutarate, we said irreversible, loss of CO2. And alpha-ketoglutarate to succinyl-CoA, irreversible, loss of CO2. So I'm the three losing CO2 steps, obviously. One more not drawn in the figure on the right is my citrate synthase. Right, which is also considered metabolically irreversible, and we'll see how it's regulated as well. And in fact, they're all regulated by the same manner. If you have ATP around, would you want to do this rigorously? Or would I want to slow down this process? I have lots of ATP. Ultimately, this process leads to production of ATP. So let's shut this down or slow this down if ATP is present. So ATP inhibits all four of those steps. Excess ATP leads to inhibition of all four of those steps. So the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, the isocitrate dehydrogenase, alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase, and even the citrate synthase step are all inhibited by high ATP. They're also all inhibited by high concentrations of NADH, which they make those things, right? So again, product coming back to inhibit the pathway that makes it. This is simple feedback inhibition. Right? And for the most part, an easy way to remember what inhibits which one of these is they're all inhibited by ATP, they're all inhibited by NADH, and they're all inhibited by something downstream of what they make. So pyruvate dehydrogenase up here is inhibited by its product, acetyl-CoA. The citrate synthase right, is inhibited by its downstream product much farther down, succinyl-CoA. Isocitrate dehydrogenase is inhibited by alpha-ketoglutarate. And alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase is inhibited by succinyl-CoA. So all those make sense. The, the things they make inhibit their own production. That's the easiest way to remember this slide. Which steps do that type of thing? The irreversible ones. So steps feeder reaction, pyruvate dehydrogenase. Step one, we consider it metabolically irreversible. Step three and step four. Right, so easy to remember, just like with glycolysis, the steps that we regulated there, steps 1, 3, and 10, all the irreversible steps.